Okay, so last lecture we introduced ordered sets, and at the end of this chapter, we're gonna introduce a mathematical object called ordered fields. And you might think that ordered fields is a field with an order equipped it such that it satisfies the um, properties of ordered sets, but in fact, it is not, and it is more than that. So first, let's look at the definition of fields, like what are fields? But defining a field requires me to list out a lot of the cosines. There's so many properties and I don't want to do so. Instead, <clears throat> I want to find fields using some concepts in abstract algebra. And then after we define, sorry, after we define fields, after define fields, we can discover all the properties and then we're able to perform all the numeric operations when we start doing math. So first, let me introduce something called a binary operation. A binary operation is essentially a function, right, on a set S. So it's a, it's a function on the Cartesian, Cartesian product of S times S maps into S such that for example, for 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 x, y, and s, x that maps to x times y. This is called like the times function or the binary operation. It's basically for this function you take two variables from the set s, and then you got the uh, element in S again is called X times Y. Okay, so now we're all good. We're going to introduce something called group. It is also a mathematical object in abstract algebra. It's the first thing you're going to learn when you start taking out abstract algebra courses. It's a group. So what is a group? It's a, at first, it's a non-empty subset G with the binary operation on it such that the following are all true. One, two, three, four. So first operation is closed. It means that for any G1, G2, and G, we have G1 times G2 is in G. Actually, it's like the, followed by the definition, right? The operation maps into the set, so it is like automatically true. And the operation associative Basically, for any, for any G1, G2, G3, and G, we have G1 times G2 together times G3, and is equal to G1 times G2 times G3. This is called associative property. And the third uh, property says that the identity element exists. What is that saying? The identity element means that there exists, sorry, there exists an element, say, i in g i for identity, such that, such that for any g and g, i G is equal to G I equals to G itself. Is an identity element is that like every element if you multiply with the element I, the identity element, it maps to itself. So such identity exists in G. And also fourth, it's the inverse. Every every element has an inverse. Which says that for any G G, there exists an element, uh, say P and G, such that G times P equals to P times G. Sorry, P times G. G times P equals to the identity element. <clears throat> and you can show that g times p equals to p times g equals to i on your own. This is easy. 
and after you have n. So if a set G has a binary operation on it and has satisfied all these four properties, then this set is called a group. And note that a group is called an abelian group if the operation commutes. It's basically, it basically says that G1 times G2 equals to G2 times G1. And why we know that out? Because we need abelian group to define our field. So, field. A field F with two binary operations, basically addition and multiplication. Addition, multiplication. Such that, first of all, F with the binary operation addition is a billion group with the additive identity zero. It's like zero plus identity element additive identity. So with that being said, the set F excludes the identity element with the multiplication binary operation is also a abelian group. And first, uh, first, second, and then we have third, that the distributive law holds, which says that for any G1, <coughs> let's say F for field, F1, F2, F3, 3, and F. We have F1 times F2 plus F3. So note that we have two binary operations, multiplication and addition. And that is equal to F1 times F2 plus F1 times F3. This is called a distributed law. So if a set F has two binary operations such that all these three are true, then this F is called a field. And we can easily show that the real and complex numbers are fields. But we have not defined real numbers yet, so the sentence is not rigorous enough. And we will define, we will define, we will define the real number set later in the complex set. Okay, now we have the definition of field. So there are many properties of a field. Let's, let's just prove them. Let's just prove like, I'll just prove the first four of them because I'm straight up lazy. Yeah, the rest is like easy. You can check on your own, it's on the textbook. So the first one, if x plus y equals x plus z, then y is equal to z. We have to show the first one is true. So y is equal to, since the identity exists, we have y is equal to 0 plus y. And is equal to the identity inverse of x plus x plus y. Because x is in the field. Then every element every element has a added inverse since x with plus is a billion group. <coughs> now since the, uh, we use the associativity plus x plus y. And now since x plus y is equal to x plus z, we can substitute in. And we use the associativity law again, right? And this is equal to zero again, zero, and this is equal to z. So y equal to z. All right, good. The second one, if x plus y is equal to x 
then y is equal to 0. That means that x plus y equals to x plus 0. And then we use part 1, we have z equal to 0. So y equal to z is equal to 0, so y equal to 0. The third one is also easy. x plus y equal to 0, then y is negative x. Why? Because from part 1, 0 is equal to x plus the additive inverse of x. And this is equal to z in part 1. y is equal to z by part 1. So y is the negative x by part 1. And the fourth one is kind of famous if negative times negative is positive. Why? Because negative x plus x is equal to 0. So we have x is the additive inverse of negative x, which implies that x is equal to the inverse of the inverse of negative x. Great. And there are like other properties here. You can take a screenshot or what. And there's more from textbook. I just want to admit it because they're like easy enough. You just use the laws of fields and use like the properties proven before and you're good to go and now we have <clears throat> discovered many properties of a field and we're going to define what's an order field so it's not just a field with an order it still has to uh, satisfy two more properties so the first one is if y is less than z then y at x is less than z at x. And the second is, basically says that if two, um, two field elements are greater than the additive element, the additive inverse, then x times y is greater than zero. So the zero is the additive identity but x times y is the multiplication binary operation just to make sure you know what's going on if f is a field with the order relation that says like these two properties then f is a ordered field Okay, now we see the very important existence theorem of this chapter. So, the theorem states that there exists an ordered field. So, in our world, there exists an ordered field. Call it R. So, R is an ordered field. With, with what? With one, R has the least upbound property. And second, the rational numbers are contained in R such that contain R as a subfield. Subfields like simple, it's like if F is a field, A is a subset of F, and A is a field, A is a field, then A is subfield of F. Simple definition. Okay. So, the theorem states that there exists an ordered field, call it R, with the least upper bound property and contains the rationals as a subfield. The rationals are fields you can verify on your own. With, you can verify on your own, it's pretty easy because 
the addition is numeric addition and the multiplication is the like numeric multiplication you've been doing since you're like five years old right so we call this field the real number field and the proof is tedious it's long i read them when i was like in grade 10 and i took like three hours to read through and didn't get anything but now after i like study more and more like it gets more straightforward to me so the proof is using a technique called dead king cut and it's really complicated and you can just google it if you and or you can look at the appendix of the book of chapter one of the book if you want to know how to prove it but i don't have enough time right now so i think that's it for the second lecture